Okay, so we're back for, I believe this is part four of hopefully four. Hopefully it doesn't take another two hours to talk about the four of these. These really shouldn't take that long, and I have a lot to say about this one, and I'm just going to put it where it belongs. I can't say that I watched season nine in one sitting, because a few episodes in, Clay and I went to go get breakfast somewhere, and I think that was the only time I got up from my seat. I binged these seasons usually over about the course of a weekend. Actually, like, over... It was usually about two... It would usually be about Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I would try to binge a couple seasons. Sometimes it would be the whole thing in a day. I believe I did that for season seven. I definitely did it with season one. I know I did it with season nine because I just couldn't fucking stop. I didn't know where season nine was going. Most of the other seasons I either did be like one through five I'd already seen. Six through eight, partly it was like a, I had quite a bit of them spoiled. Like I know where this is going. I had no notions about season nine. I don't even think that I knew it was Ruby in Wonderland, and I loved watching Ruby in Wonderland. I remember I could not go to sleep that night, because I, are, I had it in my head of like just thinking about the things I wanted to say about the season, thinking about the video I wanted to make, and just saying to myself, you can't sleep anyways, just record. Just all the stuff you're thinking now go for it. I don't care that you don't have notes or like I had a bunch of notes written on my phone because I take them as I was watching. I didn't have anything organized. It's like, just record it, go. But it's like two in the morning. Are you going anywhere tomorrow? No. All right. Just fucking do it. So I did. The reason I love season nine is because of how it resonates with me. As I've said before, I've drank the tea. And I'm still here. And the way I saw Ruby react while drinking the tea and when she's talking to the tree after drinking the tea, I recognized a lot of familiar emotions. And that moment when she's drinking the tea and then it zooms out and you just, it's Yang's eye and you know that her sister is watching this. That's pretty fucking heartbreaking. Um, I haven't had the best few days these past few weeks. There have been... There have been a few life-throwing-some-haymaker kind of days, you know? And there's this scene from Season 9 that has just been living in my head rent-free the past few days, and it's not Ruby drinking the tea. It's, she's talking to the tree, and she's seeing all the weapons. I know I've said it before. I love the metaphor with the tree of it being a blacksmith in a forge. Because what happens in a forge? Things are either made better or they are completely remade. And that's what this is all about. When you drink the tea and you do your ascension, you are there because you need to be fixed in some kind of capacity and with some of the characters like the caterpillar and the paper dudes it's your job is done you can move on but with ruby it's i feel like i am broken and need to be fixed and as she's told it's okay what you want is one of two things you have your burdens which are represented through crescent rose and i fucking love like how crescent rose is used throughout the season you can either be someone without those burdens or you can be someone who's strong enough to meet them. And Ruby looks at all these different weapons, these different lives, these different people. 
She sees her mom. and gets a little backstory with her mom. And I'm like, this is interesting shit. I can't wait to see where this goes later. And it's, she's realizing that, A, my mom, who I put on this pedestal, is not perfect. My mom had her secrets. My mom had her shortcomings. My mom had her failures. But she loved me. She loved me exactly as I was and am. And there's this one weapon she looks at that's calling to her. And of course, it's Crescent Rose. And it's like, you know, I just remember, like, I don't even remember if this is actually how it looks or if it's just how it is in my head. Of this, like, the way it's just glowing, like, this passionate fucking red. And she looks at it and she walks closer and she asks the tree, What happens if I choose me? And the tree responds, Then maybe that girl is enough. And that's what's just been in my head the last few days what happens if I choose me then maybe you're enough and it's helped it's actually helped a lot and I remember when I finished the season I was like this is like an S tier season (laughs) it's like this is Easily one. Of, by the way, I, this is not a numbered, ordered tier list. Aside from the actual tiers themselves, I'm not saying for sure. I like three more than five. They're just in the same category. But I watched. I was like, this is an S tier season for sure. This was really good. It might be the best. It might be the recency bias talking. But the more time has passed, which has only been a few weeks, I'm like, no, this is my favorite season. I put it. I have the red trailer up here because I do really love it. And like I said, this is the double S of Monty's run. I do like season nine more. And that's why there's that part of me that says maybe the red trailer should be here instead. Because as much as I love it, and I think it's phenomenal shit, can I honestly put it in the same tier with season nine? And I don't think I can. As much as I love it, and y'all know I do, it's Monty's double S, and I kind of want to put it there. I like. I feel like I want it there out of just pure respect for that. But I do... Season 9 resonates with me on such a personal level. And I think it's really good and really interesting. I remember watching it and thinking, Oh, this is so good. It kind of makes up for how much I hated the Ruby characters, like Ruby herself, in Season 6 and in Season 7. Season 8 was getting there, was getting back on track. It was like, oh, all of that, all of the bullshit and all of the dumb shit came together for this. Weiss is able to do some funny shit in the season, and that's nice. Bumblebee, I, I think the reason I don't care about Bumblebee is A... Well, I, this is really what it is. Their interactions in seasons one, two, and three don't come across as super romantic to me. There's no interactions in season four or season five. The little bit in season six, it almost seems like they're trying to treat it as this is a damaged romantic relationship and they're now repairing it. But I just, because of the first five seasons, I don't see it as such. So it feels like season seven is when it's really starting but they don't, for me, do a lot to get me invested in this relationship. Especially because, look, in these two seasons is what I really don't like one of those two characters. I think the bridge scene is actually great. And Blake, surprisingly for once, wasn't terribly written in this season. I'm shocked. But I'll take it. Yang, I thought was fine. I don't feel like, again, aside from the bridge scene, I don't remember a whole lot of strong scenes from Yang, aside from seeing Ruby drink the tea. Uh, Neo was cool. I fucking love the tea party so much. I got to see Pyrrha again. I got to see Penny again. I've said before, Ruby giving that eulogy for Penny made me fucking cry. Like, it broke my heart, I think. This season as a whole, I don't know if I would say specifically just that scene, but this season as a whole is Ruby's best acting in the entire series. Uh, Jean's acting in this season is really fucking good, too. Oh, that poor man. That poor, poor man. Oh, it was... 
I was so emotionally invested in what was happening for what feels like the first time in a long time, at least where the main characters were concerned. It was redemption for the series. It was redemption. Not that I was like, I'm like, I like season eight. I think like I have it in a, and I'm like, it's okay. Like maybe it's a C tier season. Like, I don't know. Season eight's weird. Cause I watched it and I liked it, but I'm also like, yeah, it's okay. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. There's some really, really good shit in there. And yeah, the show was getting better in there. I, I guess so. I don't know. I feel like almost season seven deserves to be in that spot. And I'm like, no, Team Ruby really sucked. They deserve here. And it's, these two are kind of a mess in where they're ranked. I feel really confident about the others so far. Again, maybe this one should go here just for season nine, but I feel like it deserves its spot there. But season nine hit me in a way that I genuinely didn't think the show was capable of. And I respect it so much for that. And again, just that, what happens if I choose me? I feel like that's a scene that's going to stick with me for a very, very long time. And while there's other scenes that have stuck with me throughout the series, it's not a dress. It's a battle skirt. This one's staying with me for very different reasons. Ice Queendom. The thing that's canon, but also maybe isn't if you don't want it to be, or if it gets overruled later. Um, the first few episodes were a retelling of season one, and then it's like, hey, we're going to do our own shit. You remember how the Ruby characters interacted with Persona characters? Yeah, so this is a Persona idea. You're going to go into Weiss's palace and deal with her shadow. This is... I feel like not quite to the same degree, but what season nine is for Ruby, Ice Queendom is for Weiss. Here is how she sees the world. She sees the world as this, not, not quite as Atlas itself, but like as this giant walled city that needs to be protected because she has so many fucking walls that she wants to put up to keep herself safe. Her happiness and her joy and her childish innocence she keeps literally locked up in jail because there are parts of herself that she feels make her weaker and inferior and that's really fucking sad her friends are people that she keeps locked up because she doesn't want them getting too close to her because if they get too close to her they're gonna learn about her family and how horrible her family is and she wants to keep them safe from her family her family is a big Nicholas. <laughs> it's just her fucking grandpa is revered to as this god. Her father is this figure looming over her, giving her orders and telling her she's not good enough. Her mother is this shadow on the wall, also looming over her that she can't even interact with. But it's kind of mocking her from the shadows and drinking her wine. Her sister is a book of judgment that is kind of it's like her source of strength and her it's like weiss's source of strength and almost moral superiority and again as kind of like the measuring stick she uses to judge herself it makes sense in that regard and whitley is this little bat thing is like this is just a minion and klein it very enforces that oh he has seven different personalities because i i picked up that he had multiple personalities it's like i don't know how many he has or get the joke and oh there's he's the seven dwarves Oh, I get it. I get it. And, uh, Dopey Klein locks up all the sillies, or the dopey, or the dummies. Some, the sub varied. Sometimes I call them dummies, sometimes I call them sillies, and I giggled no matter what. Uh, there's a rendition of Mirror Mirror sung by Pira, of all people, weirdly enough, but I still think it's kind of neat. There's no Casey Lee Williams song. Okay, there's no Casey Lee Williams songs in any of these, so, you know, they're all bottom of the fucking barrel for that a lot. Uh, but I do think the music in Ice Kingdom's good. I, I don't know if it's as good as some of the other seasons, but it's still pretty good. Like I said, I really like what they do with Weiss. They do some stuff with Blake, and I think it's alright. I like what they do with Yang. 
how they kind of recontextualize the way Yang treats Ruby in season one of, hey, sis, uh, go make friends, and yes, yeah, sis, uh, I'm gonna hang out with my non-rev friends, I'll see you later, comes across less of, sis, I don't care, I have shit to do, and more of, I can't coddle my sister forever, she needs to be independent, and if she's always hanging around with me, she's gonna rely on me more, and that's gonna take it away from her. And I, I like that. Like, you do see it throughout the season. I feel like with that in mind, it's not that, like, Yang becomes more likable, because Yang is always a super likable character to me. Even in some of these other seasons, she's usually the one I hate the least, which says a lot. But, uh, I think it does some good shit for her. I'll be honest, this is probably the season... <laughs> Which is not, again, it's not even like a real season, it's like a spinoff. But it's the season where I shipped Weiss and Ruby the most. I was like, no, I buy it. What do they call it? White Rose? I'm like, I buy it. I buy it a lot in this season. They really care about each other. Also, Crescent Rose is refigured to work as a snowboard. And I really like Ruby's beanie that just has Ruby with the W written on it. I'm like, that, that's just sick. I love this redesign. It might be the best redesign of the entire series. <laughs> I dig it, I dig it a lot. Um, oh, I don't think I really said anything about Ruby's redesign in Season 7. I really like her haircut. I, I just think it suits her very well. I, I love the Nightmare Grim. I Again, I think the idea of like a person's palace and shit is super interesting. It's just a concept I really like in general. But seeing a very unique Grim in Ruby... It's something that's been happening a lot more. There's the apathy in Season 6. There's that evolving grim in Season 8. There's all the weird shit in Ruby Justice League 2. And then there's the nightmare. I love seeing unique grim. Because a lot of just like the bears and the wolves and the rhinos and the elephant. Like I'm kind of getting bored of them. Give me something new. So anytime I get something new, I get really excited for it. You know, I feel like I was gonna put Ice Queendom in B, but the more I talk about it, I'm like, no, I think it's an A tier. Because I do really like that deep dive into Weiss. I think the pacing is a little off. I th I know I, I it feels so weird to say a one core is too long. It feels a little too long, because it's also done as like a roguelike. So we keep going back in and kind of doing some of the same shit. And there's definitely times where it feels like it's spinning its wheels. But I think the idea is strong enough and is genuinely well executed enough. And I like what they do with the cast that I, I can give it the A. So now the Justice League specials. Um, Ruby Justice League 1. It's not good. <laughs> I'm gonna be dead ass. It's not good. It uses the old ass Gen 1. I knew I was gonna say Gen 1 again. The old Gen 1 character designs. And I love it. But it feels like the Gen 1 writing. And I don't know if that's intentional. With how good... I, I guess I maybe we'll kind of talk about these together. With how good Justice League 2 is written. I almost feel like it's intentional. Like we're doing the OG designs. We're going to do the OG janky ass. Like the fights don't look that good. There's like no impact in the combat. The dialogue is terrible. The story is all over the place. It doesn't make sense. Batman's written like shit. It's just bad. But here's the thing, I had fun watching it. I, like, I, this is bad Ruby, but it's peak bad Ruby. And it's not as something like season four or season six where I'm hating it. I'm kind of having a good time with how not good it is. Uh, what are the things I liked about it? Ruby and Clark are close. Like the way they talk about leadership and the mantle of leadership and how you deal with it. I feel like it's interesting. I like it a lot more. I like it a lot more in season. Two, or excuse me. In the second one. Because it's after season 9. So Ruby feels a lot more mature. This is in season 7. Where she's a lot more sure of herself. And I think it's on Earth. <laughs> uh, but it almost works. Yang and Blake hang out with Diana. I think it's fine. Batman's written like shit and Weiss is also there and it's okay. Jean and Jessica, who is the Green Lantern here, is it 
Jessica Chavez, I think. I might be wrong. I think it's just it's Jessica something with a C. I think it's Chavez. I, should, I have my phone on me because I'm not recording with my phone. I can check this. Maybe it's Chambers. Uh, let's see. Ruby Justice League Part 1. Go, 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 go. Okay, voice cast. Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman, Flash, Green Lantern, Jessica Cruz. I knew it was a C. Thank you. Uh, Jean and Jessica Cruz are probably just, not even probably, they just are the best thing in the movie. The anxiety and frustration that she's dealing with is something like, yeah, Jean has definitely dealt with that throughout the show. And the issue of her and her semblance, like, I need my ring for it. And him saying, no, like, I believe in you. You could do this. Again, shit that people have said to him and, like, being the Pira that she needed. And then him seeing Pira and, like, I know it's not real, but I have to go for it. Like, fuck, that's so sad, man. I feel so bad for him. And it's great. And then you have the weird love triangle with Cyborg maybe hitting on Nora, but not really hitting on Nora. But Ren thinking he's hitting on Nora and Ren being mad that... Yeah, Nora's bad that Ren's getting mad and it, it's just bad <laughs> I just fucking hated it um yeah I said it already I didn't think the fights were that good I thought the actual animation in the fights was not very good there was like I remember Clay specifically saying because he only watched these two of me he's like is it always this weightless there's times not always but yeah it's super fucking weightless in this one I just don't think it's good but it's a C tier. It's not nearly bad enough for that. If season six isn't, it's not that. I don't think it's as bad as season six. I don't think it's as boring as season four. I think it's a C tier. Like, it's not good. But it's it's kind of fun. With how bad it is and how jank it is. I was having a good time. I don't respect it, though. The way I respect season one for its sincerity I don't feel like this didn't have that feel, especially if the badness was on purpose. That makes it a bit more tongue in cheek and kind of funny. I can maybe respect it for that, but I'm not sure. And then we end with Ruby Justice League 2. Oh boy, Ruby Justice League 2. I said after I watched it that I felt like this was a perfect way to end all of this. Because it takes place after season 9, which is goaded shit. I feel like we're following up with that in the way that Ruby is written and the way that Gang is written. We get the teeny tiniest of sneak peeks into Vacuo. It does confirm that Watts is dead, which I was like 90% sure that he was. Like, I, I don't think he got out of that room and, you know, the city did fall. He's probably dead. It's like, yes, 1000%. He's dead. That was a great way to end things. Uh... Ruby's conversation with Clark essentially reinforcing the don't stop but slow down and also reinforcing that her recklessness and refusal to stop and slow down is not out of this desire to destroy herself. She says to Clark, I'm just aware of my own mortality at this point, so I want to do as much as I can with the time I have left. And Clark's saying, okay, I get that. That's cool. Just make sure, but, like, you can do things to make sure the time you have left is longer. Just try to do that. And she has a nice, like, reconciliation with Yang about that that I fucking loved. Yang has this good relationship with the Flash. Who, after all the shit in episode one where he was possessed by the antagonist, is having PTSD from that. And she's like, hey, I've had PTSD from a villain. It gets easier. It gets better. It's not easy at the start. I'm not going to lie to you about that. But there are things that help and the support system helps. And knowing that you're more than the parts they took from you. It's beautiful shit and I love it. Blake. Uh, Blake doesn't really do much. Again, I, I, I don't want to shit on Blake. But I feel like in the later season, like pretty much in the post-Monty seasons... Blake either does nothing or I hate what she does with the sole exception of season nine where she's like, oh, we're in a fairy tale. And remember, I like books. I think this is awesome. Like, this is endearing. Oh my goodness. I like Blake in a season that hasn't happened since like season five. <laughs> oh my gosh. I can't believe it. 
but Fleek doesn't really do anything, but she's inoffensive. Weiss is dealing with the PTSD of my home is fucking gone. And I think it's interesting. Uh, Watts is having the time of his life. Um, I guess the time of his after death, afterlife. It's a ton of fun. The Grim keep evolving as they're fighting. Like, there's one made of kryptonite, or like with kryptonite on it, so Clark can't fight it. I think that's really neat. Uh, there's this joke with Joker and Harley <laughs> that I think is fucking great. I, Clay got a big laugh out of that one. I thought it was great. Uh... I'm gonna be dead ass. This is S tier. <laughs> I really, really did not expect Ruby Justice League 2 to be an S tier installment in the Ruby series. But it was. And I think it was a great way to end. And uh, this is how we end. Nothing in bottom of the fucking barrel. And we take that. Season 6, F tier. I think it's terrible. Season 4, Yang is what saves it from being here. There's a part of me that thinks it's worse than season five, or excuse me, it's worse than season five. There's a part of me that says it's as bad as season six or worse than season six, but Yang's storyline to me is so good in this, it saves it from those dregs, but boy is it close. And our mid-tier, surprisingly the Yang trailer, because I don't think it's very good. This, which I don't think is very good, but it's a ton of fun. The respect tier, I think this is fine. Maybe that makes it more here, but I kind of respect what it does for the way it establishes Blake's story. This is not very good, but it's so fucking sincere and genuine, which I mean, that's the same thing as sincere. It makes me a lot more forgiving of its problems than most of these later seasons, and I have a genuine soft spot for it. This, if I liked the main characters more, would be around here-ish. If I liked everything else less, would be about here-ish. So I think that's fine. And then the good shit. This is a really good trailer. This is a really good season. Has some problems, though. Kind of the same with this one. And this is... I just think it's pretty fucking neat. S-tier. I do think the first half of season three is okay, but the climax is so fucking good, and the intro is so fucking good, and what it does for the lore, especially in the hindsight of later seasons, is so fucking good, I can make an argument for it being the best. This does so many things right, that I can genuinely ignore how mid the climax is. I can't quite say that about season two, because at least this has the Cinder Raven fight! <laughs> But season two, I feel like, is close. Like, of everything here in A, it's the closest to being an S tier season. Maybe I could put it in S. I think I'll still leave it in A, but I might change my mind on that some other time. This is just really fucking good. I, I liked it more than I liked Ice Queendom, so I feel like I can justify putting it up here. This, to me, is perfect Ruby. The fighting is great, the music is great, the weapons are great, the janky-ass weird visuals and character models I think give it so much personality, the weird textures on thing give it so much personality. I think it's phenomenal. To me, this is just, honestly, kind of a peak work of art, and genuinely one of the best things, regardless of medium, regardless of genre, that I experienced this year. As a whole, I will use season one. As a whole, I'd probably give Ruby an A? Maybe a B? It's like, there's... There's problems, and there's mid, and then there's... It's as it's probably I kinda like it. There is a lot of good shit here, though. Actually, one, two, three, four... Five, six, seven. Then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I feel like in these higher tiers, there's more shit than in these lower tiers and then these mid tiers. So I would say, you know, there's more good than bad. There's more shit in A than anything else. So I feel like overall, I would say Ruby as a series is an A. Maybe a little more of an A minus, but maybe these two bump it up to being a strong A. But there we go. That is my tier list on 
the four character trailers, all nine volumes, Ice Queendom, and the two Justice League specials. I don't want to do a character tier list. No, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I feel like I talked enough about the characters as a whole. I might just make a character tier list anyways and post it. I feel like you kind of have a good idea of where most of my characters are going. I will probably use these same tiers. As much as I don't like Crow, I don't even know if I would put him in bottom of the fucking barrel. I'd be tempted to. Maybe I wouldn't. But, uh, that's it. That's the tier list. Uh, how do I want to end this? I had something in my head, but I'm like, no, that's from another YouTuber. I don't want to end it like that. So, I guess I will just say I'll see you around. Today is Tuesday. I recorded all of this in one day. This is a long fucking day of recording. Um, I don't really know what I'm going to do for my Thursday video. Because I don't have a lot to say. But I guess I'll see you then. So, have you know what? Monday is Christmas. Have a merry fucking Christmas. Have a happy Hanukkah. Have a winter solstice Kwanzaa. I don't care what you celebrate, but I hope you have a fantastic holiday of whatever it is. You enjoy time with family. You enjoy time with friends. The ruby is just the friends and family we made along the way.